on this week's episode of the Real Lives Podcast. Just launch. That's something that I've always believed. Just launch. And it's like, and if not all your team members have that same perspective, like your company is going to fail. You don't take a lot of actions because they're based off of like your past, past traumas or past experiences, or even just saying like, someday I'll do this once I have money. And it's that you're kicking the ball. I, I realized from that course that I had a lot of things that were pen preventing me. And it was all me, preventing me from doing stuff that I want to do. On this week's episode, we have on Zach Schlein, who is a the CEO of a dating app called Filter Off. Zach is a serial entrepreneur. And in this episode, we talk about all the businesses that he started, the ones that he's failed, the ones that have made a success of, and also filter off his most recent endeavor, which has been a massive success. And we talk about how he managed to get a dating app off the ground, how he managed to bring in clients to use the app, you know, selling it to investors, how he managed to, you know, get in the New York Times, the BBC, all these different things, and how COVID was a massive turning point for the business itself how he managed to find a niche within the dating app area in a very saturated market with the massive contenders like Tinder, Hinge, Bumble, all these different kinds of things. So really interesting conversation with Zach. So I hope you enjoy this one. And yeah, you can find all his links down in the description below. So go follow him wherever and go, go use his app if you're single, because you know, why not? So yeah, enjoy the episode with Zach. Okay, Zach, so tell us who you are and what you do. Yeah, first of all, thank you so much for having me. Uh, my name is Zach Schlein. I'm the CEO of Filter Off. Uh, Filter Off is a video uh, speed dating app, and we also offer matchmaking. Amazing. Thank you for coming on as well. I really do appreciate your time. So to start off with, let's go back to the beginning. You've, you've not just you know been the CEO of Filter Off. You've had multiple companies throughout your you know your entrepreneurial career so at what point did you realize that you had this sort of entrepreneurial edge compared to most people that you then wanted to fulfill as you got out of college and things like that yeah i mean i kind of had my first taste of entrepreneurship uh my senior year of college at syracuse i was doing a a project that ended up turning into a a business and after starting that, I, I fell in love with the, the opportunity or the possibility to create outside of the classroom something that I was passionate about. And it was, it was just so, so much fun. Um, and it kind of got all my creative juices going. Uh, it was just like everything that I enjoyed uh, when it came to building companies. What was it that made you want to start that first venture to help students um it was a startup to help students find uh job opportunities or gigs um and it was just like this is something i wanted so that was kind of kind of been the premise of everything i've built is like stuff that i thought i think would be useful for me or stuff that i want to build for me yeah, I suppose it gives you purpose then, doesn't it? Because if you see a gap that you think would actually work in the market, then uh, that you would actually use, then it makes everything probably much easier to continue to do it. Because I get in terms of like market research, you've already you already know that you want it. If that makes sense, so yeah, it probably 100%. makes it a bit easier to follow through with it. Yeah, I mean, listen, I've also done projects that I stopped working on very quickly. So I think it's, I think it's super important to do something you're passionate about. And because you're doing these things for the long run, they're not like one month gigs, they're five years oftentimes or mo much longer. How'd you take that big step then into, into that first entrepreneurial venture where you're probably sat there thinking about how everything can fail, how, you know, in six months, you could have lost all your money. How do you actually take that step and take the risk to get into something like this? Yeah, I mean, the first thing was just the biggest risk was time. And that obviously is a risk. Um, and just started, I, I never really had the mindset of like, what if it fails? It's just like the mindset has always been like, let's just try to 
build something that's super valuable and that's really awesome and let's see what happens. Um, so that's, I think that's more just like a perspective thing. Was the first one on your own or was it with, did you do it with friends? I did it with, uh, someone who became my friend. Yeah. So how did you meet them? Introduction. I was working, I started this project and I was like, oh, I want to build this as a business. And then one of my buddies, CJ, uh, made me an introduction to my then co-founder. Okay. Interesting. So what made you want to bring them on board? Uh, they, at the time, they were also passionate about it. Uh, they seemed like a good guy, and I couldn't do it alone. So I think it's more fun to do it with someone. Um, so that's why. What were some of the mistakes that you made early on with that first first company that you made? Yeah, I mean, uh, some of the legal stuff I would have rewrote, rewritten. <laughs> um, I ended up having a partner breakup, so I would have done some things differently. Um, also, just launch. That's something that I've always believed. Just launch. And it's like, don't shoot for perfection. Um, and and I think if your team members, and it, was, it ends up being the three of us, um, and if not all your team members have that same perspective, like your company is going to fail. So, um, yeah, there's definitely some flaws there. So in, you said there, obviously there was a breakup involved in the middle of this whole thing. It's with, it was with begin you, is that right? And I'm not saying, yeah. So how did that affect you and how, like, how did your performance change? How did your ability to, you know, just get daily tasks done as a result of that affect your, the business. Yeah. I mean, when the partner, when we had the partner breakup, it was kind of the demise of the startup. Um, but yeah, it definitely impacted me. It was like a breakup. Um, and it was not a breakup that I wanted. Um, in hindsight, it's probably a great thing that it happened though. Um, because again, if you're not on the same page, uh, with the person you're working with, uh, that is not something you want to do for the long run. So for my own mental health as well, probably the best interest and also get opportunity cost, right? By working on something that's not the, and I put right in quotes, uh, your you, it's an opportunity cost to not be working on something else. Hmm. Makes sense. So. How did, why did that happen? Was it just a difference in opinions on the way you wanted the business to go? Was it just, they wanted to try something new or what was going on there? Yeah. I don't want to get into too many details there because I want to be respectful of their privacy, but I mean, totally different ways of conducting a business. And, uh, for me, I believe always to do it one of integrity, um, and doing the right thing. And, uh, uh, I did not see eye to eye with that. That makes sense. So how was it then from that, obviously that breakup to when the, you just stopped with the business and, you know, moved on to the next thing? Yeah, it was pretty quick to move on to the next thing. And, the the next thing that I worked on was a muffin company and ended up, uh, partnering with my mom on that. It was a paleo muffin company. So like health and nutrition was, and still is. Uh, extremely important in my life and I wanted to build a company that provided a meal replacement muffin where where on earth do you a come up with the recipe for this how do you deal with distribution because obviously one if you get you know a few clients on board who are willing to sell it you need a lot so then if it's just you and your mom like how how do you balance all that how does it work in relationship like that with your parent work and all those things yeah it was definitely I mean, our relationship probably changed in some ways where we spoke a lot about business, but it made us a lot closer. Um, my mom actually is, uh, has passed away since then, but like that was such a an amazing experience I had with her. And it was so special that I was able to do that with her. So yeah, I, I wouldn't uh, trade that in for anything. Um, but... She built the recipe. She made the recipe. She was a great, she was just great at like baking, cooking. She could do, she was just awesome. And then I did the business marketing side 
And in the beginning, I remember we were in our kitchen, me, my mom, and my dad, and my mom made like 10 variations of our banana chocolate muffin. And it, it's paleo, so it was coconut based. Um, there was no uh, like flour. And I remember we like took notes on each one until we found like the perfect version. Um, and then based off that banana chocolate, she made an apple cinnamon and she also made a chocolate zucchini um, muffin as well with like a certain texture that was similar to the banana chocolate. Amazing. Where did you even start in sort of trying to distribu distribute all, you know, these products and how did you get the clients on board to actually, you know, want to buy them and sell them to their customers? Yes. Yeah, so in the beginning, so we didn't know if people wanted it. I thought it would be helpful, but I, I turned to Kickstarter. So I launched a Kickstarter campaign for anyone who doesn't know what Kickstarter is for it's crowdfunding. Um, and we ended up selling a lot of muffins. We hit our goal. I think it was around $5,000 of selling muffins. And I ended up getting um, serve safe certified as well as my mom. We literally baked in a test facility um, and shipped these muffins. Um, so, A, we wanted to do it in a test facility because it was legal, and B, that they could bake so many more product than doing it from, let's say, your home, um, where you only typically have one oven. Because we had to pump out hundreds of muffins, um, close to a 1,000 muffins. Um, so, yeah, that was a fun time. I realized I... I kind of hated baking, but I uh, had to do it. <laughs> this customers were paying. But from there, after we fulfilled our orders and realized, okay, we have product market fit, people want this, uh, we found a, uh, a manufacturer test facility. Um, and then we partnered, we had like a deal with UPS, and yeah, we were shipping across the country. Have you always had the confidence to just, just, do these things like because it's something like that you can obviously overthink it and think oh well no one's going to want it and obviously you did the kickstarter but still after like getting a client on board is still a completely um you know can be a grueling task to to get them so how do you have the confidence to keep pushing through things even if you may be second guessing yourself and second guessing the product that you might be trying to sell yeah i mean growing up as a kid i I wouldn't say I was very confident at all. I think just doing quite a bit of like personal development courses. I took one when I was 18 called Landmark Education, which is definitely probably the most pivotal thing in my life aside from having great parents and a really great brother. Um, so aside from those, I would say that course had made the biggest difference in my life in terms of kind of... Um, you realize about yourself, and I'm talking for myself, and I'm sure others can resonate, is like you don't take a lot of actions because they're based off of like your past, um, based off of like past traumas or past experiences, or even just saying like someday I'll do this once I have money. And it's that you're kicking the ball down the, the road um, around someday. Um, so, yeah, I, I realized from that course that I had a lot of things that were pen preventing me, and it was all me, preventing me from doing stuff that I wanted to do. Um, so, yeah, I think you realize you don't have to play the victim or you don't have to and take responsibility. The stuff that happened when you were a 14-year-old isn't going to happen necessarily now. It's just like it was a shitty situation. It was... Uh, a bully who's an, who's a shitty person, but like you don't now have to walk around with that and think of yourself still like that as a, I guess at the time I was eighteen. So it just really kind of gave me a lot of I don't even want to say confidence, but it was kind of like starting fresh. I was like, wow, like I've been holding myself back, and it was like the world's my oyster, and I realized like you can really can create kind of anything. Obviously. If you want to be a basketball player, height has something to do with it, um, typically. Um, but like to build, to get a skill or uh, do something entrepreneurial, a lot of it is just kind of belief, but also like 
doing taking the right steps, like learning new skills. That's uh, and but it's yeah, it's having the right mindset as well. But it's not just like you can't just say I'm gonna have the right mindset. There's oftentimes stuff behind that. Um, and by thinking that, like positive thinking, doesn't work. Um, yeah, it's about action, isn't it? It's so, about action and yeah, and resolving like previous past traumas in your life that are always going to hold you back because you could still take action, but you're you're taking action and avoiding certain things. So you're taking action, but going down the wrong wrong path. How did you deal with those traumas? And at sort of what point did you realize actually what may have been holding you back at that point because of such little confidence when you were younger? Did you realize that it was these, you know, these situational traumas that happened and things like that? Yeah. I mean, from that course, like a lot of these things came up and I was like, holy shit. Like a lot of these things that I'm not doing um, is because of these like certain events that occurred when I was much younger and still carrying that weight on my shoulders, which is just like utterly ridiculous. But it's, I guess it's that thing as well, though, that you don't, you don't know it. Like you can't make the connection between the two things unless someone says it and Obviously, during that course for you is probably like that sort of the shattered glass moment in your head where you'd like, oh my God, this is what has actually been holding me back for so long. Yeah. I mean, I remember, and listen, like, I would say I was shy as a kid. I would say I was unconfident. Was I the most shy and the most unconfident? No, but I definitely wasn't on the path to building businesses at 18. Um, if it would have happened, it would probably be like, 40 or 50 um, when I was more stable. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think, uh, yeah, it just takes, you just got to keep going forward. Yeah. So with that company, how long were you, the, the one with your mom I'm talking about, how long was that going for? And at what point did you realize that you wanted to move on from that and that it wasn't something that you wanted to pursue for, you know, another five, 10 years? Yeah, so we did it for a few years. Um, I would have done some things differently, but it was great learning experience. And I think that's the beauty is like all these previous companies I ran, and most of them didn't work out. Um, where like, and I, I define in this case working out where like it gave me financial independence. Um, I realized like, hey, we should probably stop this because a we got rid of our co-packer the facility they were just not doing the quality that we're doing and it was tough like we were producing and getting sales but not enough for like a major facility so like these major facilities require like a thousand units a day something significant so it was just quite difficult and i didn't want to do a, a full-time job at baking um so we ended up yeah shutting that down and then i ended up starting an online mental health uh, community after that when you're going to that decision and obviously you're thinking about moving on from the business and stuff like that what point do you take the plunge and like obviously it takes time to think about that kind of thing of moving on and finding something new but obviously you need an income that like you need an income so what are your thought what's your thought process at that point when you're thinking you know what this may not be for me i might i, I might need to move on yeah, so at the time I was at a nine to five at Johnson Johnson, so I had an income. It was just like there's so many obstacles in terms of like we got rid of the co-packer, we tried to find a new one. It was really difficult to find a new one uh, for the amount of units we're doing, and just got to the point like, hey, we could potentially this we may be able to find another co-packer, but like it's going to require a ton, like a few more years to get this like ramped up and I, I think we were both burnt out my mom and i and we're like it was fun it was a lot of fun but it was difficult and uh yeah we just decided let's let's uh let's close up shop and move on to something else mm. so why the mental health business why why did you want to start that what was the where did that desire come from yeah so it really came from the desire of it was an online mental health community called 18%. And there just really weren't many online communities for people that wanted mental health support that would be free. Like therapy was 
or therapy is and was super expensive. Um, there's crisis lines, like crisis text line or national suicide lifeline, but that's for if you're in crisis. What about the people that just want to chat with each other um, if they have depression or bipolar or an eating disorder? So that was kind of like the gap we filled. And we ended up, I ended up so launched this community, um, got our first bit of users through Reddit, and it really grew to, I think it was close to like 20,000 members. It was the largest online mental health community on Slack. Um, and yeah, we had, we ended up partnering with a crisis text line. So anyone that was not in crisis would send members our way. Um, so just wanted support. Um, so yeah, it was a really beautiful community and it saved so many lives. And yeah, it was really really amazing to work on that things like that are so important because you know for, for those people who can't afford to go to therapy because like here in australia it's like like i'm lucky enough that through the university where i work i actually just get that for free but it can cost 245 dollars for an hour session and if you're doing that once a week <laughs> you know, for the amount that you need to be doing to actually develop yourself, understand past traumas and things like that, you probably do need to be going an hour, an hour a week, but most people can't afford to be spending a thousand dollars a month on something like this because they've got bills, they've got kids and all that sort of thing. So 18%, was it just, so obviously would you create these subgroups of like people who suffer from X or Y, and then they would sort of then be able to just talk about their experience with that thing. Yeah. I mean, typically, so we had like a general, we had like a general support channel where people would just chat, um, people introduction channel, we had moderators, um, and then also different subgroups like bipolar, depression, eating disorder. Um, and then oftentimes people would just uh, connect in these groups and then take it to the DMs um, and just, and we had like millions of messages. It was it was wild um, how active this community was. Did you expect it to get as big as it was? I had no idea. <laughs> I was just like, so actually, I forgot to mention what also inspired me to build this. It was actually the thing that inspired me was I had a close family friend by the name of Lewis. Um, and when he was... A teenager he got diagnosed with bipolar and schizoaffective disorder and a few few years later he went for a walk and he didn't come home and his remains were found near a river um and that's actually what inspired me i was like what else what can i do um so i ended up raising a significant amount of money and i donated to nami national alliance on mental illness and i was like what else could i do and end up building this community um, for, and it was really targeted to teens. Um, but it, I mean, I would say the median age was like probably like 21. Um, so it skewed really young. Um, I mean, it was all ages, but definitely skewed young, especially for people that often were too nervous to tell their family that are going through something or they, um, yeah, or like they just were, just felt super alone and just didn't have the support. See, that's something that recently I've become a lot more open on with everyone in my life is like the mental health struggles that I go through and things like that, because there is no, like, cause I'm what, I'm 24. So obviously I'm around that age bracket where it's younger. People don't really expect it. You know, they, they don't really see because, you know, to them, like I've moved to Australia, I've got like a life that I really enjoy and all these things. And sometimes you just have to be open and honest. And like, I've had, because of that, I've had friends tell me that they experience an X, Y, and Z and people actually begin talking about things. And it's like, people just need to realize that like, if, if your parents find out that you're suffering from depression or anxiety, actually it's not the end of the world <clears throat> because they're going to be willing to help you. They're going to be willing to help put things in place to help you get better. People like us, especially that young, think that they're the only one and that they, they have to isolate themselves to get through this kind of thing. Because obviously at 21, most people can't afford to go to therapy. So they end up just sitting with the thoughts and it stews and gets worse. Yeah. 
No, for sure. So, so when you started that, was was this sort of a non for profit organization, or was there were were you making money out of this thing as well? Yeah, I mean, so we put it as an LLC just uh, for liability purposes. Um, it was primarily furry. Um, we ended up white labeling a course. Um, we sold a few, we had a newsletter, we had a few advertisers, but it wasn't really a money play. It was really just to support people. Um, and then, yeah. And then I started filter off 18% lasted about five years. Um, and I started filter off and that was really the first business that I started that allowed me to be financially independent, no longer having to rely on a nine to five. The, the conception of filter off obviously must have been through your experience of online dating using other apps. So what was your experience of online dating through other apps and where did the idea for the, obviously like the speed dating video chat come from for you? Yeah. I mean the idea, so this is before the pandemic. Um, yeah, just using dating apps and realizing like, this is super inefficient. Like a lot of people don't look like their photos. Oftentimes you get to an in-person date and you realize there's no chemistry. And so I, I would ask dates beforehand that I met, Hey, would you be open to video chatting? And most said, no, they thought it was really weird. Um, some said, Hey, I'd be open to a phone call. Um, but the ones I agreed to video chat, it was just like, wow, it's a much better experience. I could like see them. I could see their smile. I could hear their voice. I could see if we have chemistry. Um, was it foolproof? No, but it was a lot better than texting. And I was like, why don't people, why don't dating apps have this like functionality where it's like, it brings you to the video chat as the user experience. So that's what we set out to do. My co-founder and I, Brian, um, yeah, launched it not much traction and then uh pandemic happened and everyone who thought video dating was weird no longer thought that so uh <laughs> the sentiment really changed overnight how did you deal with those early stages where you weren't getting much traction with the business and what were you doing to try and get the ball rolling i mean i was posting in online communities i was hitting every person on my facebook i was just like yeah guerrilla marketing to a t um most of the people that chatted were like, they would ask each other, how do you know this app? And they'd be like, oh, from Zach. <laughs> like, it was really just my people in my network. Um, but the pandemic uh, really changed things for us. At what point during the pandemic did you manage to get people on board? Was it almost straight away? Like, what, And what were you also telling people when you were obviously trying to pitch this idea of use this dating app over the likes of Tinder, Bumble? hinge, whatever else it may be. Yeah. I mean, the thing that really kind of blew us up in the pandemic originally was the BBC. So I pitched the BBC, they took the pitch, they did a segment and it gave us so many users, thousands and thousands of users. And like overnight, it was not like Zach, that's how they know this app. It was just like, oh, we heard about it from the BBC. So it was super cool to like, just have users that didn't know me. Um, and then following the BBC, we got New York times, which was humongous. And then we just got like 50 other publications. I was quite good at getting into the press and, uh, really use that skill set during the pandemic and like the ability to date safely during the pandemic. So what sets filter off apart then from these other apps? Obviously with them, you can message and then eventually have the video chats, but what is it about that? Like that, cause obviously you do it's four minute speed dating, isn't it? So what about that four minute speed dating? That, is it that works? Do you think? Yeah. So filter off, it brings you to that video chat. Um, and again, it's just like, instead of just texting back and forth and meeting up in person, realizing you don't like each other, it, it br brings you to a video date. Um, aside from that, we also rolled out a premium matchmaking service called Matchmaker Pro, and you're actually assigned a human matchmaker. So it's very, very high end. 
Um, it's been incredibly successful to the point where people are already dating from that service and it's so cool. Mm. So how, this is what I've always wondered about these apps, other than the paid memberships that usually they have, how does a dating app make money? Yeah. I mean, dating apps, uh, aside from paid, some dating apps make money through advertising. Um, that's a big one aside from subscriptions and a la carte for us. Uh, we make money from this premium service, this matchmaking service. Um, we have a great product. We have a lot of users. Um, so it just made sense to, uh, implement this, um, to really have a curated experience and still leads to a video date, but you literally have someone in your corner uh reaching out on your behalf mm, that's good but the have you, so have you ventured down that sponsorship route of trying to bring in extra income or do you not do you not dabble with that at all yeah i mean we've had some advertisers i think it's a fine line like if you have too many advertisers it starts tarnishing the user experience so the advertisers that we've brought in the past have to align and like it has to make sense like, I'm not going to bring on like a video game company. Like it, that makes no sense. But like for something that is really aligned, like a, a, a men's health brand or product, like that makes sense. Um, things like that. So it has to kind of fit kind of what our brand is all about. So how do people go? So talk to me about <clears throat> the user experience. So when someone's downloaded the app, they've created the profile, what do they do and why is it? in your opinion, a better experience than the other apps from that moment forward? Yeah. So you're presented different profiles. Um, if you both like one another, that's kind of, this is where the, the, the fun part of filter off. Like if you both like one another, we put you in, we set, we have an AI matchmaker that sets you up on a video date. Um, you coordinate a time, they help you, and then you jump in this video chat. It's four minutes long, you play different icebreaker games. And that's that's really kind of the the beauty of Filter Off is this short speed date and you get to see someone. You get to actually see a person and not just a profile. What do you not think though that four minutes is too short for people to understand whether they could have a connection with someone? No. Why is that? Yeah, I, I mean, when we first launched Filter Off, it was actually one minute. Um, science shows it only takes a few seconds to see if you actually like someone. Um, I think from a dating perspective, now running like thousands and thousands of video dates, I mean, four minutes is really the sweet spot. If you, Once you start exceeding four minutes, uh, people get frustrated because they're on dates they don't want to be on. Um, when you go be less than four minutes, sometimes they're like, wow, that went way too quickly. So four minutes has been our sweet spot. Um, we got a lot less email, a lot fewer emails when we hit the four minute mark. <laughs> well, it's, for, for me, I'm thinking like, because in four minutes, you can't really get to know who someone is. Like you can understand no, no, a bit no. about the personality, but like, you know, some people may be looking for someone who's in like a decent job or like they live in X place or, you know, they have a certain hobby and things like that. So do you not think it would be better to have that longer interaction at the start so people can understand that? Or do you think that the four minutes where you begin to actually understand if there is just a connection is worth it? Yeah, exactly. You hit the nail on the head. Again, our app is also about efficiency. So four minutes is kind of ideal. And then if you both like one another, you could always message. You could always ask those questions over message, or you could just hop on a video chat again, but it's not time bound. Yeah. So what's some of the mistakes you've made with filter off and how have you reconciled them? Yeah. I mean, I've in the past, I think you should always, you should always have learned the skill set your first before hiring someone. Um, so I think that's one thing I've learned a lot about is hiring. So, um, another thing I've learned, um, what's that? It's big, like, uh, what else have I learned? Fundraising. I mean, we were able to successfully fundraise, um, 
raised about $2.4 million. Um, I would have started, I think the economy has really changed. Um, probably would have started focused on money earlier, but in hindsight, like it wasn't really about revenue two years ago. Um, and now it's very focused on revenue. So, I mean, I think you adjust based off the time too, but now it's just like, I want to build a great company that brings in lots of money and, uh, one that can last years to come and, uh, provides a, a fantastic experience for our users. In terms of the hiring process, then what do you look for in someone when you're obviously interviewing them? Like, cause obviously now with the new wave of entrepreneurs that are coming through degrees are less and less useful. They don't really see that as the, the selling point. It's more about what, what the person has done the personality, things like that. So what are you looking for in that interview process? Yeah, I mean, I could just talk about the last hire I made. I hired a matchmaker. Uh, when we rolled out our matchmaking service, I acted as the matchmaker. And it was just insane because I was doing my day-to-day -day for filter off and also matchmaking and doing intake calls with new clients. It was just way too much work. So I ended up hiring a matchmaker and interviewed a number of people. One was... Do you care about people? That was the most important one. Two was, do you listen? Three, would I enjoy working with you? And like, are you coachable? And like, four, are you like a, a nice person to talk to? Because I'm going to be speaking to you all the time. This is our most important thing we're rolling out. So those are the things I was looking for. And then aside from that, like, pay very close attention to detail, be very organized. I mean, they're juggling multiple clients. Like this is a fast moving, high stress, but you also have to have speed because you have multiple clients. You can't just be like spending hours and hours on one individual because then what about your other clients? So it's, it's a lot of work and it's difficult. And uh, I found someone who is incredible and she is so amazing. Mm. So as a CEO, obviously you have your day-to-day your -day roles and things like that, but what goes on behind the scenes that people don't see that you have to do on a regular basis that people may not think a CEO would ever do? Yeah, I think it depends on the company. I mean, for me, I'm very marketing focused. That's like my bread and butter. So right now, promoting uh, this matchmaking service, writing a lot of copy, sending a lot of emails, building out the funnel uh managing our facebook ads and tiktok ads um yeah it's a, a lot of stuff that i i do on a day-to-day -day. and then working closely with our matchmaker supporting her um yeah and then in terms of like looking back at everything you've learned over the multiple companies that you've you've started and then obviously moved on from and now you're at filter off if knowing everything you know now what would you do differently? I would, I think it's important to focus on bringing in revenue quickly, um, to build a business that people want to pay for, um, by having revenue, it allows you to be financially potentially or closer to be financially independent and also gives you kind of the confidence that, Hey, this company works. Um, leveraging ads. I mean, ad costs are a lot more now than they were five years ago. Um, so, I mean, it's always changing. So, um, yeah, with my muffin company, probably leverage ads a lot more than I did. Um, now it's a lot of email. Um, so leveraging that and writing great copy, I've been reading a lot on copywriting and things like that. So I, I'm always growing. I'm always learning every day. And that's why I love marketing. It's so much fun. Being obviously a CEO, there's, you do it a lot of hours constantly. Like you probably consumed a lot of the time by the job that you do. So how do you deal with burnout and how can you, how do you set aside work at times where you absolutely need to? Yeah. I mean, I burn myself out and when I burn myself out, I stop working. It's like, so what do you do to sort of bring yourself back to 
I will go to sleep really early and get a lot of sleep. Um, but I also, I'm like very disciplined. I have a really good routine, so I make sure to stick to that routine. Um, and then another thing is travel. I love, uh, traveling. It's when I'm really burnt out. That's like the next thing. Just take a trip. Even while working, I typically am working when I'm traveling, but like getting outside of my like day to day, my normal environment just is such a amazing rejuvenation. So I'm really into it. Yeah. Where, so where did this need and want to travel come from and how have you pursued that whilst running full-time, you know, companies and because it's not like being a ceo is not 40 hours a week it's 50 60 70 so how during the early days of businesses and stuff like that where you've probably felt burnt out how have you managed to travel and see things and allow yourself to switch off for a bit i mean it's also like based on the circumstances right like if you can't if there's something super important like if you're doing a fundraise you probably shouldn't be traveling like, you want to be in your city. So it's based off circumstances, too. Um, but no, I mean, I've loved traveling since I was a kid. My parents and I and my brother, we would, they'd bring us to places. And, like, a lot of it was in the U.S. I mean, we were, like, middle class growing up. And then um, on occasion, we would go to some, like, really cool locations like i went to australia and england and when i was little and yeah and then i studied abroad i went to syracuse university and i studied abroad in madrid and just like fell in love with travel because i was every other week i would go to a new country in europe and then after that i just did end up doing some solo travel and when i worked at j and j while running a company i always made sure to get out of the country once or twice a year and um yeah so i've just made it part of my life i kind of just like anything that's important to me like i want to shape the life i want to live and but you have to work really hard so i work really hard on filter off and i also sleep really well and i eat really clean and i work out almost every day and so like there's a lot of stuff people don't see so um yeah so Obviously, with you, you say you're working out every day and stuff like that. So, on a day to day basis, what's your what's your routine looking like? You said obviously you're quite disciplined. So, what what time are you waking up? What are you doing from that point? And then, like, how long are you at work for? Is it that do you set a specific amount of time for that, or do you sort of work as long as you need? And then, what do you do obviously afterwards to sort of wind down and switch off? Yeah, I work as long as I need. I don't really. I was going to say I don't really switch off, but I do sometimes switch off. I mean, like, this is, like, my life. It's so much fun. Um, but, like, when I go out, I try not to, like, talk business and stuff, If it depending on the setting. Um, like, I think it's important to switch off. Um, but, like, today, for example, I woke up at 6 a.m., worked out with my trainer. I work out virtually. I have weights at my house, so I just get out of bed have a coffee, work out with him, then went to my office, and now it's 7 p.m. Eastern, and I'm still working. So and I'm going to do some work after this, and then I'm going to go home, cook dinner. I love cooking. I cook almost every day. And then I will maybe watch some YouTube or something, but I have no interest in working, like, this evening. I think, like, there's no point. Like, I'm working a lot today, and I it's important to shut off, turn off, and then um, I like to get eight hours of sleep. So, and then tomorrow, do the same thing. Brilliant. So, there's one question I always ask people at the end of the podcast, um, and that is, how would you like to be remembered? Yeah, I think um, to be remembered for someone who is very kind to others and uh, makes people feel good when they're around me. Amazing. So I, I appreciate you coming on the podcast. Um, tell everyone where they can sort of find you, where they can find filter off and things like that. Yeah. So 
um, filter off. We're on all the socials. Um, our website is getfilteroff.com or you could search and we're available on both app stores. Um, and the matchmaking service is also on online in terms of me personally, also on Instagram, Zach zero eight five nine zero. And, uh, yeah, so I'm available on the socials too. Wonderful. Thanks for coming on. Appreciate your time. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me. Massive thanks to Zach for coming on the podcast. Really enjoyed this one with him. Sorry about the audio. One of my microphones broke, um, which is why it's similar to the one with Brian Townsend, the agent. So yeah, apologies for that. But yeah, you can find Zach's links down in the description below. So go use the app. If you're single, obviously go follow Zach. You can find him on Twitter and places like that. Um, and also remember to like, subscribe, share the podcast because there's like 1% of you who do. And that's really frustrating. And so, yeah, please, thanks. I would massively appreciate it. Cheers. I hope you enjoyed the episode. I'll see you next week for another episode.